Welcome to Paradelphia Radio. This is Rick Pruitt. I'm here in the Toxic Studio with Mr. Dougie Doug Hogate. Y- yes, yes. I'm trying, I'm trying to get the used to this. You sound awesome with these new technology things. Well, we got here. We, we've up- upgraded our tech here. Yeah, apparently. Uh, <laughs> yeah big time. Toxic Mike uh, had a little uh, little spending spree, and he went all out. Mm-hmm. Got nice new mics here. Got some uh, some new. Uh, uh, graphics for the online folk driving a Ferrari. You driving know, a Ferrari just got now. a you know five million dollar house. So we see where you know where our gonna, money's going. We're not going to ask no, questions. <laughs> I, I don't care where it came from. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just keep bringing the upgrades. That's fine. yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's okay, fine. I'll live with it. All right, so tonight, yep. uh, we got a few things to talk about. The main thing in a little while is going to be something that's kind of interesting. I came across this uh, topic oh two or th- three months ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was, it was kind of neat. It was something that, uh, kind of came out of the blue. I was reading a story in, uh, I think it was online or something Mm -hmm. about this, um, this, uh, this God from the Mayan culture right? and how he related to, uh, the character of Batman, right? which I thought was interesting. But then when I read into it and saw the actual, um, uh, the, the, the visuals, like the, the, um, the artifacts Mm -hmm. from this god this mayan god that was around hundreds and hundreds of years ago Mm -hmm. it became real interesting because it was very very similar well it's identical i mean right when as we before the show started i'm looking up and i showed you i'm like man that is to a t yeah Yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna get into that in a little bit we'll talk about the uh the myths of the mayan god along with uh how it kind of relates to the modern day uh dc comic Mm -hmm. incarnation of uh of the batman we all have known since forever oh yeah uh, but before we get to all that, we've got a couple things to talk about. Uh, coming up this Sunday yes, at the uh, Lincoln Financial Field, we have our Toxic Tailgate. Mm-hmm. Um, it's going to be the Eagles and the uh, Chargers. Chargers playing on Sunday. But mm-hmm. before that, at noon, we're going to have all kinds of shenanigans going on oh, yeah. over in Lot N, like uh, Nancy. And I don't know. Oh, I, okay. I'm trying I to think it. of a different word. I for get N, it but. now. I thought you were going to say, "Who's Nancy and why yeah. are they going to be there?" But yeah. I get it. N, N, in, like Nancy, lot N. Then Nan over, over right near the uh, the Jetro parking lot. Mm. Uh, so uh, yeah, we're going to have all kinds of cool stuff. We're going to have free giveaways, live broadcasts, music, uh, you name it. We're going to have toxic radio personalities. Uh, we're going to get Doug to take his shirt off. I'm just looking for. Free hoodie. Yeah, <laughs> we're, we're, we're gonna we're gonna see what Doug's willing to do for a free hoodie. Oh, we are. When did that? I guess that just came about. It just, it just came to me. Yeah. yeah well, yeah. Mike's obviously and in agreement because he's clapping through Mike, the glass there. You Mike's know, on so. board. Yeah. yeah. Wow. What will you like? Kind of yeah. like what will you do for a Klondike I'm bar? I'm telling you. You know what's funny though? Being in Philly for an Eagles game, I think I would do pretty much anything except wear another team jersey, especially Dallas. Don't ask me to do that because I'll just die. <laughs> then you wouldn't have to give anything to me. Yeah. So we're, <laughs> so we're going to find out what Doug's willing to do. Hopefully it's cold. I haven't looked at the weather. It's going to be like... Uh, <laughs> You'll be to jump in an ice yeah, bucket full of it. Yeah. A new ice bucket challenge. Yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe an ice bucket challenge <laughs> when it's like 35 degrees out. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, and I'll forget to bring a change of clothes. We're, well, no, because there'll be a hoodie there. Yeah. Well, you got, you got <laughs> to earn, thing. You gotta earn the hoodie. Uh, yeah, oh, I got you. All this toxic apparel that I'll be... Uh, yeah. yeah. All right, so uh, that's Sunday coming up at noon. Uh, if you guys want to get down there, uh, it's going to be a real good time. Oh, it okay. always is every time we. I mean, it's been a while, but yeah, it two, definitely three, is two awesome. three years since we did this. But mm-hmm. uh, yeah, last time was was a really cool uh, cool experience, and the game starts at four thirty. So noon tailgate, you guys will have four hours to frolic mm-hmm. and and drink, you know, uh, adult beverages. A little bit more uh, acceptable, if, I guess, because. Because the game starts at four thirty rather so than choose. one. Yeah. Well, the, it's funny because um, a, a buddy of mine used to have season tickets, so I used to go to quite a few Eagles games. And the um, as drunk as people got, and as crazy as they got at the one o'clock games, the mm-hmm. four o'clock games were always insane. Oh yeah, because they still start at the same time. Be- right. Because, <laughs> because they like we're starting the, the tailgate at noon, but right. the uh, the honest truth is, uh, a lot of people get there at like eight in the morning. Oh my god, if not earlier. And start yeah. drinking at eight in the morning. Yeah. And by the time the game rolls around, they've already so either sobered up or or they're, or they're so obliviously drunk. They don't even know where they are. They don't know where they're at. They're thinking they're like, We're at a Flyers game. I did this <laughs> I did that one time. I was at, uh, when the Eagles were still playing at the vet, I remember I went to a uh, Eagles Vikings game. Right. And we got just ridiculously hammered. We were ha- we were hanging out with um Do you remember being at the game? I remember being at the, <laughs> No, well here I'll tell you I remember being at the tailgate. Because we were hanging out with some Vikings fans, and this one girl was dressed like, um, oh. 
she had like the the pigtails, like the blonde pigtails. Like yeah. she was dressed like a like a Viking uh, maiden or whatever. right, like a yeah. So we were hanging out with them, and I got ridiculously drunk. We went into the stadium, and I'm not sure where. I think our seats were like 500 level. I remember going into the stadium. I was somehow on the lower level. Okay. I found myself on the lower. I watched some of the game, but I was just so obliviate, uh, obliterated, right? That I turned around, went back out of the parking lot, and I slept <laughs> in the back of a truck. <laughs> just a random truck. I, I it might have been our truck, oh, wow. I, but like it wasn't my truck. Either way, it, you slept in yeah, someone's truck. It might right. have been somebody we knew. I can't swear that it was somebody we knew. Well, I don't know, mean, but at, it was it was a truck, and I slept there for three or four hours. At least you didn't like wake up and the people of that truck after yeah. the game drive, and you ended up in. I'm on my way to like Delaware. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, you, it, it's funny. I've been to plenty of tailgates. I have never been to a professional football game. That is a shame. I swear. I, I've de- I've been to ba- I've been to Sixers games. I've even been to like the the uh, lacrosse the. Billy, what is that? Uh, the not wings? Soul, the wings. Yeah. But I, I'm telling you, I've never, and it's and it's a shame because I'm a huge Eagles fan. I've never been to a professional game. Mm. Maybe I can get like some cheap tickets for from some scalpers out there. There are no cheap uh, tickets. Yeah, I know, especially now, right? Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. matter. Eagles can be good. They can be horrible. It's tickets still, are never cheap. Yeah. 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 All right. So that is coming up Sunday. Uh, also, I wanted to mention, uh, coming out very, very soon is going to be our friends from Scary Monsters are going to release their issue number 124. Wow. It's their winter edition. It's called, uh, subtitled, Chili Thrillers and Frosty Frights. Okay. So that is going to be coming up, uh, I believe they released that sometime in l- either late November or mid-December. I'm not sure what, what their uh, publication schedule is right now. Okay. I know they just finished up, we just finished up with Halloween, and they had their Halloween issue out since mid-September, I right. believe. Um. But again, that's always a, a you know a really cool thing to look forward to the mm-hmm. art for the artwork alone. Oh yeah, on the uh, on the cover, you know, it's like um, so if you can't read, you can still get the magazine <laughs> and be impressed. But uh, but I, but I think they're gonna they're gonna have um, the the cover references um, obviously you know with the title of uh, uh, Frosty Frights and thrill, uh, Chili Thrillers. Right. It's gonna talk about a lot about uh, the thing the uh, uh-huh. the remake of it back in the early eighties. Okay, yeah. Which everybody seems to think was like even my wife thinks this, and she doesn't watch horror movies at all. But she loved that movie, really. And and I I don't dislike the movie. My opinion of that is that it just doesn't really hold up in terms of um, special effects. Yeah, especially for when you look at the original one compared to even in the eighties, they didn't have the special effects that they do now. Right. Still, I, I get what you're at saying. At the yeah. time, it was probably state of the art, and people were freaking out because uh, yeah. it, they hadn't seen anything like that before. But it's been 40 years. Mm, like right. it, it, it doesn't really hold up the special effects. The story is great. I enjoyed the story, mm-hmm. but then it, when I see like the, the the monsters and the thing, you know, um, coming out of different people and animals or whatever, right? It just it kind of takes me out of the story because I'm like, that looks like something made in like a high school. Mm-hmm. SF- Some low, SFX class or really something. low budget, yeah, like extra credit project. Yeah, God, nineteen eighty, forty years ago. Can you believe that? Yeah, well, I think the movie... not. Not to like cut off of that, but when you said that, I'm like, man. Yeah, I think the movie was eighty two. So it was early eighties. Yeah, 80, still either way. I mean, geez, but yeah, <laughs> but that is, uh, you know, that's one of the one of the uh, movies they're going to be talking about. They're also mm-hmm. going to have some uh, Christmas themed um, horror stuff. Which there's a lot of that out oh, there. Oh yeah, more than what you people think. I mean, I mean, last year the the uh, Colonial Theater did their. Uh, in fact, they're going to do the second edition this uh, this winter. Their Krampus uh, was it called Krampus Claus or Krampus Miss or something like that. I'll oh okay yeah. I'll, I'll find out it, more about is that, that later. You talking about the the movie that came out? No, they did their virtual. Oh the, oh I event. see. Okay, I'm with you. It was All like right. the night before Krampus or something. Right, like that. right. I got you. Okay. Um, and they showed uh, a couple of movies related to Christmas. Okay, yeah. Like one of them was, uh, I remember one, <laughs> I sat through this thing last year. It was the most ridiculous movie. It was like from the early 50s, I think, mm-hmm. called Santa Claus versus the Martians. Oh, real? Oh, I got to look it li- at it. And it literally was Santa Claus <laughs> fighting Martians. Fighting Martians. Yeah. It's like, forget Christmas, I got to save the world. It was It was beyond ridiculous. Of all the people to save us from Martians. But uh, but Give yeah, I'll, I'll get more information on that for for the next show. Uh, but I do know they're doing that again this year. It's not okay. going to be a virtual thing though. They're doing live events now at Colonial Theater. Right, right, which is awesome. Yeah, so, cool. All right, so that's going to be uh, coming up very very soon. Cool. All right, so uh, before we dig into our uh, topic of the evening, the Batman slash Mayan origins, 
I did have an article that I found a few days ago mm -hmm. that I thought was really fascinating. We've talked about this topic a couple times on the show, and it will, like Mike talks about the stuff we talk about sometimes as as like uh, uh, what are they called? Ooh, pot weed, talk, pot talk, weed talk. Yeah, like you have to be high you have to, to, be to, to on even some kind of psychedelic to right. and get what we're saying to but, understand yeah. what the hell they're talking about. <laughs> so this is one of those things. Um, this is an article that was in a magazine called Monte Cristo Magazine, which I honestly don't know what that even is. All right, but it was called the tantalizing time looping science of retro causation. Woo! So. All right. We talked about retrocausation a couple times. Retrocausation, basically, in a nutshell, says that, um, like, you know how in regular in a regular timeline, things you do now affect your future. Yeah. All right. That, right. That's just common sense. Mm -hmm. um, this, though, is talking about the fact that time is not linear. And because time is not linear, it's sort of all over the place. Mm -hmm. And things that, and what this is saying is things that you do now can affect your past, which ultimately then affects your future. So it's like you're going back to affect right. what the, is going to happen. Like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very so so right. So so let's say you lived your your entire life um, and you had no interest in um, I don't know pick a subject geology. Okay. All right. But somewhere along the line. Um, as an adult, you decided you wanted to take classes in geology and become a geologist. Right. Okay. All right. And you made some kind of famous discovery because you passed your classes, you graduated, you went out in the field and you found like some unique dinosaur or whatever. Right. right. Or, um, yeah. Well, I guess it might be geology, paleontology, whatever. P <laughs> Along the lines of that, right. Pickonology. <laughs> but you made this discovery in real time in the year 2021. So what this is saying is that making that discovery, um, doesn't only affect your future going forward, mm. but it also may affect your past. In, in, in let's say in in various ways, mm. but it could be the fact that you make this, this discovery, and your past self at the age of say ten, yeah, or fifteen or whatever, trying to figure out what you wanted to do with your life, you may get this idea in your head that hey, archaeology, uh, geology, might not be a bad idea. So it's almost like you're giving your Ask self a some right. premonition, right? Of what is going to come, right? But how would they know if that happened? Well, they wouldn't know. Well, you're and, right, and but it, it's saying uh, okay. So I'm, let so let's 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 go a different way with definitely this. a mind wrap right there. Let's say that um, right now, yeah, um, I leave this show tonight and I get this you know bug up my ass to start doing uh, work in uh, uh, let's say archaeology. Okay, all right, right. So, uh, you know, I, I start reading books on it, and I get this, you know, real strong in, in inclination to do archaeological work and study it. Right. Where did that come from? Did that come from just my own thinking? Maybe I read a story about it. It, it could have come from anywhere. Uh, yeah, I say. But yeah. it also could have come from my own self 20 from, years down the road uh, Right. that is now a full-time archaeologist and loves his work. I, I'm with you. Okay, yeah. So that... that caused retro causation to filter backwards through time and ne now me standing here in 2021 i have this out now of the blue idea of like right. wow you know maybe i should do this now where does this spawn line of like in a sense you know when people say like uh, subconsciously it's always been something you've been into maybe not something you always thought of but then again like you just said it could affect everything. So it, does that kind of fall into like your subconsciousness where yeah, it it's could. kind of always been there? It could. So okay, I got you. Yeah. So, it's just, so your subconscious idea is that you're you're attributing to just your own self or your own right. thinking. It's like a part of you has always wanted to do that, has always wanted to be that. Uh, right. And I've even heard people say that it's kind of uh, sometimes they'll, they'll talk about how it's um, maybe your your uh, your deceased loved ones. Uh, right. Okay, kind of yeah. have their 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 uh, pump ideas into your head. Uh huh. Because they can see a wider picture and they can right. see, hey, this is going to be beneficial they're, they're for you. They're trying to direct you in the so right path. They're trying to direct you in the right path. Right. So maybe it's that or maybe it's retro causation. Or maybe it's re oh, right. Exactly. There's so, all kinds of different things that. Yeah. So the way this article goes, um, it, it, it kind of talks a lot about uh, just the general idea um, of retro causation. But uh, let's see if I can get to a part here that's relevant here. Um, what this is saying is in the general population, we are apt to dismiss precognition. Spe uh, precisely because it's so common. Deja vu is an enduring reality glitch that may have strict 
mechanistic origins. Nobody really knows. Mm. But many of us have had the experience of bumping into a friend only to, de- to declare, hey, I was just thinking about you. <laughs> All right. As observant, uh, rational materialists, we generally would chalk that kind of thing up to coincidence. But sometimes the odds are really long against that thing. Mm. And what this guy is saying is recently he's telling the story of, a, of his own um, something that happened to him. He said, recently I encountered encountered an old acquaintance at a Starbucks. Immediately before our collision in space-time, meaning them running into each other, mm-hmm. he said he hadn't thought about this person since she moved to Toronto in the 1990s. And right before he ran into her, literally ran into her in a Starbucks, her face flickered before my mind's eye like a single index card rising inexplicably from the vast, undisturbed filing system of the unconscious. Okay. Or subconscious. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so basically what he's saying is that this person he hadn't thought about for 30 whatever years, mm-hmm. for whatever reason, her, her image, her face popped into it his just, head. It's like your brain gave you a quick signal, like, right. boom, and, think of this person. And right. then two minutes later, he literally bumped into her at a Starbucks. Could it also be, I mean, maybe that's, again, something that people who, uh, I mean, I guess in a way it's psychic or some kind of... Uh, well, well, what he's saying is that if you look at it in the terms of retro causation, what it right. could be is that he bumped into her in the Starbucks. Therefore, that caused her image to pop into his head two minutes earlier. Uh, okay, yeah, okay. Well, I'll tell you what. Usually I'm with it with different things. This is just a total wraparound right here. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> the, the key, and, and the, the toughest part of all this is we're so inclined to believe that um that time is linear that it yeah. go, that it goes in a straight line and we've heard from numerous different people over the years that that's not the case i mean i believe it too i mean time time exists in its own way oh i mean just going outside of our atmosphere i mean, I mean again you're really getting into some deep stuff here but when you look at time what like for example i mean i don't know if this kind of falls under the same line but where they do these experiments where they have astronauts go up to the International Space Station for a year. Yeah. And they did it to that one uh, guy's last name, Kelly. He had a twin. Mm He was an astronaut. He spent a whole year in space. And then they did tests on him as well as his twin brother. Right. Because they were accurate. And it showed that he aged a little less than what his brother did who was on Earth. And, I mean, again, I know that's time versus, like, you know, how it affects us physically and whatnot. But, again, I mean, I think time is just different no matter where you are. I mean, what we are here in time, just, let's say, on Earth, it, it's just not the same. Time, I mean, time is a man-made, man-made it is. construct. It, it, you're right. I mean... You know, we, we wanted to have a way to mark the passing of events, mm-hmm. and we set up time. We it's set like up a, a timeline. It's like a filing-type system that... Yeah. Yeah. So this guy that wrote this uh, this article, he tells another story here. He said he started keeping a dream diary um, because he believes that dreams are actually little snippets of the future letting you know what may happen or people you may run into or it could be a hundred different things. Mm-hmm. Um, so basically what he's saying here, he tells another story. He says, um, okay, so he says uh, he kept a dream journal and he said, I tried to be skeptical. He said, I learned that my dream life has an enormous cast of characters. So an unexpected email from an old girlfriend received about a week after she made a little cameo in his dream diary. Mm. So he says, let's call that statistically plausible. Okay. Still, the evidence was accumulating at speed increasingly. Random dream fragments corresponding with trivial events in reality, culminating eventually with episodes too provocative, not to mention pointless, to be explained by math. He said, after a fitful night, fitful night, and just minutes before waking, I dreamed of a uniformed man gliding past my kitchen window in the dead of night. Less than an hour later, in the dark of morning, that's precisely what happened. Alarmed by, by the commotion he made, I looked up from the kitchen sink just in time to see that the courier, smiling and waving as he shimmied past the window, uh. um, was, you know, he was waving and smiling. He said a detail that wasn't recorded in the dream, but it was... He's, Everything else was. He, yeah, he's seeing this right wow. before it happened. So he said, may, he says maybe, but uh, that's the first and only time that the FedEx guy, FedEx guy has ever turned up before noon, let alone before breakfast. And he had no inkling that he was expecting any package at all. Right. So the idea is that this dream he had of this, you know, person walking by the window mm-hmm. 
was actually retro causation in action. It was his dream mm-hmm. telling him that this was going to happen. Right. It, it might might not have been exactly specific, but it but was, it gave some kind of sense. Right. Like, hey, it gave the idea. Know, it's almost like bad prep yourself because yeah, yeah. I mean, that's. I don't even know what to say about it. I mean, that's just intense. <laughs> so it's, I mean, and the idea is is fascinating. And I, what I would love to do is get somebody on the show, and I'm, you know, hopefully we can do this, get somebody on the show that knows a lot about this. It's maybe written a book about this or mm-hmm. has done research on this um, and kind of pick their brain about it because it's one of those things that, you know, I get it. I understand what they're saying. I, I understand that the, the mechanism they're claiming is happening. All right. But I would just be curious as to what the ramifications of that are uh-huh. because if this yeah. is real if this is actually what's happening and time is not on a linear base uh, not happening on a linear basis it's jumping all over the place yeah you have the future informing your past and your past informing your future and who the hell knows what you know what's happening out there um where does that leave us you know what- i mean yeah it's and and not only that where does that fall into you know they always talk about different things you hear things about time travel so to speak you know, is this something that falls into if time travel exists, how to not just see or or, or dream or whatever the case is, but right. excuse me, physically in a sense put yourself in that to where you're physically going and jumping through that time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's so many different things like I yeah. can I can see why it'd be weed talk. <laughs> All right, so let's jump to our uh, main topic of the day here. Uh so I mentioned this at the open. Um Batman. Yeah, yeah, my favorite. I, I've loved Batman since I was a kid. Everybody's all uh, familiar with Batman, mm-hmm. and most people know uh, the origin story in the comic. Um, this is a little bit about the origins of the character Batman. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. So what this says is in early, early 1939, due to the success of Superman in action comics, it prompted editors at the National Comics Publication, which would then become DC Comics, no to request more superheroes for its titles. In response, Bob Kane created The Batman. He collaborated with a guy named Bill Finger, who recalled that Kane had an idea for a character called Batman, and he'd like me to see the drawing. Okay. So I went over to Kane's, and he had, a, he had drawn a character who looked very much like Superman with a kind of reddish tights and boots. Uh, no gloves, no gauntlets. He had a small domino mask and swing, uh, swinging on a rope. Uh, he said he had two stiff wings that were sticking out the back, uh, looking like bat wings. And under it was a sign that said Batman. Um, basically, what happened was Finger kind of played around with it. This guy, Bill Finger, um, he suggested a cape. Um, he suggested getting rid of the red tights. He kind of made Batman into the Batman that we that we know that we today. Did. Well, it started to sound like you were explaining Spider-Man. Yeah, well, a little bit, yeah. Right, like, you know, with the rope and hanging from the rope and whatnot, minus the wings, but yeah. Anyway. Right, so so this Batman that they created um, back at the original uh, incarnation of Batman in the 30s, um, one of the other interesting things was they said he had to have a alter ego. Right. And he had to name the alter ego. So that became Bruce Wayne. Two first names. But uh, <laughs> where he got that, uh, Finger says Bruce Wayne's first name came from Robert the Bruce, who was a Scottish patriot. Okay. Who was actually related to my wife. I found this out through Ancestry. Really? Yeah. So yeah. so could she have the Batman DNA? She in may her? have. She may be oh, Batman. Man. I'm married Taren, to, Taren is Batwoman. I'm married to Batwoman. <laughs> um Wayne, being a playboy, was a man of gentry of the gentry, and he said he searched for a name that would suggest colonialism. He said he tried Adams Hancock, then he thought of Mad Anthony Wayne. So, uh, late, so later, his suggestions were influenced by um, Lee Fox popular The Phantom, mm-hmm. which was a radio show uh, and, a, and a newspaper comic. Um, so basically, the name Bruce Wayne came from him trying to uh, piece together a name that was both uh, colonial in nature mm-hmm. and, for whatever reason, Robert the Bruce, which maybe he was Scottish, I don't know, but right. part of his heritage. Had some kind of origin to it yeah. in one way or another, right? Yeah. And uh, and obviously the, the the you know the Batman origin story within the comic right you know everybody's heard that story about how Bruce Wayne was a little boy he saw his parents killed at a, in a robbery mm-hmm. he kind of got all this vengeance in his heart and decided he was going to take it out on and, uh, criminals and that right there is the original I mean I think they tried to play around with a few other 
origins of what got him started, but that right there is the original main one of his parents getting yeah. killed and whatnot. So Much like any other thing. So the interesting thing about all that is that the original Batman um was much more violent and harsh than what he became eventually. Oh yeah. The, I, the original Batman was was literally out for blood. He was out for vengeance. Mm-hmm. So he would go after these criminals and he would literally like torture them, kill them. Like he wasn't just all about, hey, I'm gonna send you to jail. Oh yeah, it was he, oh yeah, he, he wanted He was like out to said, take revenge. Blood. He wanted death, right. So with this in mind, um now we go back to the Mayan culture. Mm-hmm. Um and they had a character, a god, named uh Kamazots. We were trying to figure that out. Is it Kamazot or Kamazots? Kama, Kama something. Kama Chameleon. Kama Chameleon. Yeah, I know. Uh, so, uh, this is an article talking about this Kamazots. And we have um, a couple of different uh, pictures, uh, I believe we can post on our show notes, that show, in fact, I posted one today on um, Facebook and Twitter, which basically shows a, um, a uh, not, not a costume, but a um, ceremonial mask or headdress or body mm-hmm. dress that looks a lot like the Batman costume. Um, so about this character, this this Kamazots in ancient Mayan uh, culture, he says uh, this article is from um, 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 uh, history101.com. It says, what if we told you that a far darker and more ancient version of Batman first existed thousands of years ago? His name was Kamazots, and he was a Mayan bat god of night, sacrifice, and death. Kamazots was said to have have the head of a bat, a partial face mask, pointy ears, and the body of a man. All such similarities to the Dark Knight and there, however, as Kamazots was not the type to waste his time crusading for Gotham's return to justice. While he may not have been a billionaire with a secret stash of all the latest uh, technological crime-fighting gadgets, he was definitely both honored and feared. So the origins of this god, all mm-hmm. right, it says the ancient bat god seems to have first made an appearance in Mexico around 100 AD, where he gained a literal cult following among the Zabotec tribe. The Zabotec associated bats with death and the night, bats with death and night, mm-hmm. for reasons that would have made a great deal of sense at the time. Um, all bat, after all, bats were always inhabiting the caves around what was known as the sacred uh, Ceno- Cenotes. Um, and ancient Mesoamericans believed that was a path to the underworld. So this god came to be right. uh, in part because the ancient Mayans believed that these uh, cenotes or cenotes, mm-hmm. which were caves, led to the underworld and they led to um, death and dark places. All right, so stay away from the caves. And <laughs> Right, and bats lived in those caves, mm-hmm. so they associated the bats with all of that. Right. So therefore, this Kamazots naturally would have an in- inclination to be dark and brooding it's like and death. violent. It's like being death, right. so to speak. Yeah, yeah kind of, almost kind of like the Grim Reaper, right. so Exactly, to speak. right, right. Um, seeing them flying out, the bats he's talking about, seeing them flying out uh, of what you believe to be hell would probably be enough to spook anyone into adopting a pretty shaky view of the mysterious winged creatures. Mm. From such late-night bat encounters, legends of a bat god were eventually born and made to make the rounds among various tribes and native Mesoamerican people. Commonly depicted holding a sac- uh, sacrificial knife in one hand and a human heart in the other, mm. Kamazots was not really destined to be a god of the warm-hearted variety. I would say not. Again, leading back to the original Batman, who was a very violent individual. Right. Um, Kamazots' name literally means death bat. <clears throat> and in the Quiche language, uh, a Quiche... The Quiche, a Mayan people, are the original inhabitants of the Guatemalan highlands, where their lush culture flourished long ago before the age of the Spanish conquest. Scholars believe that they fused the tale of the bat deity with that of their fire god in order to create a truly terrifying creature called Kamazots. Mm. Much of the surviving history and tradition of the Quiche can be found in a text they produced, which is called the Popol Vuh. Or Popol Vey. Po- okay. I've heard it called two, both ways. Right. It's basically like their Bible, so to speak. No, okay, I see, yeah. Uh, the Popol, Ve- uh, Popol Vu, which translates literally as the Book of the People, contains a collection of Mayan stories and legends that were originally passed down through oral tradition. 
They were finally committed to paper in 1550 and were preserved when an 18th century Dominican friar named Francisco Zimenez translated them into Spanish. Mm. So the Popol Vuh contains one of the most notorious of Kamazat's surviving tales in which he encounters the Mayan hero twins Hanupa and Zabankwe. Twin characters were common motifs in the old Native American tales, and the Mayans especially seem to love them. Uh, the use of twins in such legends generally seem to represent the idea of duality, sort of like yin and yang. The idea being that light and dark, the sun and the moon, day and night, etc., balance each other out to create harmony. The hero twins were what we might call demigods of today. So, Hanapu and Zabankwe have a whole saga that plays out in the Popol Vuh. Uh, That's but a tough word. <laughs> Popol Vuh, yeah. Popo. Popo. Just call him the Popo. Popo. <laughs> but the one in which Kamazots is featured uh, does not depict their finest hour. As the story goes, the twins have been invited down to the underworld, a shadowy place known as Zabala. Uh, like heroes of the countless other epic tales, the twins spent most of their journey being forced to contend with a huge number of trails and obstacles, the hero's journey, mm -hmm. so to speak. Uh, well, things were going pretty well until the Lord of Zabala challenged them to spend the night in Zatzahala, which is the underworld's resident house of bats. Hmm. The twins were pretty cunning and decided that they would outsmart their outsmart their challengers by shoving themselves <laughs> shoving themselves into their blowguns. Oh yeah, for the night. Because you know why wouldn't you do that? Because that's feasible. <laughs> um. As they lay there, using their blowguns like protective burrows, the bats in the creepy cave eventually became uh, began to calm down until ultimately all was silent. Mm. It was then that Zimbabwe got a not-so-bright idea. Mm. Hey, dude. Hey, dude. Hey, dude. Hey, dude. Since you know, that's how minds talk. Like, yo, bro. Zimbabwe <laughs> said to Hanupa, maybe it's dawn. Check it out and see if all the bats have left. For whatever reason... Hanupu agreed to the plan and stuck his head out of the blowgun to check for the all clear. I take a big mistake. Unfortunately for Hanupu, this was just the opportunity Kamazots had been waiting for. Mm. The bat god wasted no time in swooping down, decapitating Hanupu, and hanging up his head to mm. be used as a ball in the god's next ball game. Mm, see that? Not a way to get ahead in life. Yeah. <laughs> In other parts uh, of the Popol Vuh, Kamazots makes other appearances in the form of a man with bat wings. This time, he acts as a messenger from Zabal uh, Zabalba, who arrives to broker a deal between humanity and Lord Tohol, the patron god of the Kiche. Uh, humanity has decided that it wants access to fire, and it wants it bad. In the end, mankind promises... The <laughs> just reading this for the first time <laughs> in the end mankind promises their armpits and wastes to the god in exchange for the wish I mean it's reasonable right humanity's trade off is actually a reference to human sacrifice yeah. uh, during which the chest was opened from the armpits to the waist good so they're not I'm glad they're they're not, they got not, that squared away they're not literally putting their armpits in they're saying we, we're gonna right. we're gonna right. allow ourselves to be sacrificed mm -hmm. uh, or at least some of our people in order to obtain fire. Hey, sometimes when you're cold, you know, you yeah. need fire, you'll go to great lengths. So uh, so the inspiration for Kamazots uh, says, when compared to the average everyday bat, a creature as horrifying as Kamazots could be seen as a bit of a stretch. After all, bats aren't really so bad when they're not accidentally getting tangled up in your hair in the middle of the night. Mm. So some of them are eventually, uh, or I'm sorry, even kind of cute. Uh, people have pet bats as pets sometimes. So why? So <laughs> why here, Roscoe? I don't know why Roscoe came right. up as a bat name, but yeah. So why all the negativity? Yeah. Uh, so the first is that Con uh, Kamazots was inspired by Desmodius Rotundus, aka the common vampire bat. So while these little guys are fairly small, they do have a nasty habit of sucking the blood of other animals. Uh, also, where you're getting your vampire tales. right? Vampire right. Um, beholding such a sight in the middle of the night or worse yet finding a random bite on your livestock or yourself could admittedly come across as a bit scary. Uh, the second theory, however, makes a little more sense. All right, it says that some scholars now believe Kamazots was based on a species of bat uh, called Desmodus draculae, which is now extinct. The creatures were once native to Central and South America and were not exactly your typical harmless fruit bat. These things were anywhere from 25 to 30% larger 
than the common vampire bats of today, and apparently they loved the taste of blood. Uh, you said Dracula. I think Dracula when you say yeah. that, but anyway. Yeah. yeah. Uh, while some researchers believe they sucked the blood of small animals, others believe they went for larger prey, such as deer and cattle, possibly humans. Right. All that we really know about them is what little scientists have been able to glean from their fossils, but they were doubtless as terrifying as they sound. So hmm. what happened to the bamf- vampire bat's larger, scarier cousins? Well, the truly unsettling part is that scientists don't really know. Researchers have been uh, unable to pinpoint exactly when or even if they went extinct. Extinct. For all we know, they're still lingering in some bat cave out there. Yeah, I um, mean, I mean, caves are like almost like an ocean, so to speak. I mean, they right. They go deep. I mean, so these bats, these large bats that were blood sucking, violent bats in the right. in the eyes of these um, ancient people, mm-hmm. became the inspiration for this Kamazot's character. Um, and while Kamazots enjoyed his heyday in Mayan culture thousands of years ago. His legacy still lives on today. Um, Stephen King named a character in his Dark Tower series after the ancient bat god, reimagining him like a beam guardian oh, who wow. takes the form of a bat. Get out. Okay. Yeah. Mm. So, um, so it, it it has, I mean, this, this Mayan, in a sense, Batman has been used in cultural or, or pop culture, so to speak, before. Right. Yeah, so... So, uh says a few years ago, Kamazats also inspired uh, a common internet rumor. It claimed that Batman-style bust had been found among the ancient uh, Mayan ruins and was even accompanied by a really cool photo. Unfortunately, the piece in question was actually created in 2014 uh. as part of a Warner Brothers promotion. Oh, <laughs> So the studio decided gotcha. to, decided to mark the 75th anniversary of Batman in style. So they cooked up a really cool exhibit with Mexican Museum of Design. A number of artists were invited to contribute their redesigns of the hero's famous bust, and an artist named Christian Panchado came up with the one in question. Mm. Inspired by his love of Batman and history, Panchado created a sort of Camazotz style Batman bust that was so realistic many people on social media mistook it for the actual artifact. As People on social media tend to do is mistaking things or yeah yeah. yeah. So the, the the bust was actually made uh, that that I have in, on that social media post was actually made in 2014. Right. However, the idea still exists that the inspiration for the Batman character in part came from this ancient god. And you know I had mentioned this to you before the show. I mean when which we've talked about a couple of different things, but. I mean, first off, without getting too far off of it, I mean, I, I remember when I was younger, one of my friends, uh, he had an uncle. I remember we were over his uh, his house one time. We were hanging out, and we had, like, MTV or one of the music shows on uh, or channels on, and um, it, it, there would be, like, a rap song come up, some kind of rap or R&B music video come up, and this he was so in tune and knew so much about music, he pretty much took every song that came on rap or R&B song and told us what song it came from that originated from like the 1930s and 40s. Now, what my point is to that is it's almost like when people come up with these ideas or create things, whether it be music or, or in this case, you know, a character, a comic book character, it's like, are they taking something that they think people aren't going to right off the bat? No. I mean, you really have to, in a sense, dig, which nowadays is a lot easier with the internet. But, you know, back when Batman was created... Our source of information wasn't as as big as it is now. Right. So it's like, did did they come up with like, oh, look, look at this? We could base a character off of this, and how are people going to just to think, oh, look up Mayan whatever? Right. And I mean, much like anything else that we have out there nowadays, it's like there's some origin or something that that was given them the idea of like, oh, let's base it off of this. People aren't going to know. Yeah. It's a little harder nowadays, like I said. Now I'm really yeah. gonna blow your mind. Okay. So, retro causation, we talked about that a few minutes ago. Right. So, what if this hey. is in play? What if Batman was created in 1939 and caused retroactively for the, the Mayan people to create this bat god? I see what you did there. Okay. Yeah. So, see how I tied that together? Yeah, that, tie. That's, that is, yeah, that goes perfect. So, so if that's that, pretty badass. <laughs> if, that is, if that is true, if that idea is true, then it's possible that. This is what happened. It's we, like a creation that happened at one point made another creation, but in the past. Yeah. Which caused the creation, and it's like a big circle. Yes. You know, it, yeah, I, I get it. Okay, H- H- hence, time is not linear. Right. 
Right. It all like works together with itself. So yeah, very so, cool. I'm not saying that's what happened. I'm just but saying still. You know, if if you believe in retro causation, then it's possible. It, it is very possible because the the Batman that was created in '39 was a very vengeful character. Mm-hmm. He was he he was a uh, had the face of a bat, so to speak, with the hood, you know, with his costume mm-hmm. on, the body of a human being, which is very much like the ancient character right. of Kamazots back in the Mayan culture. So it would kind of be. It would kind of be like this. So let's say the mines, they had the spear of these the bats and what they thought caves were and whatnot. So then, it, like you had said, the creation of Batman in 1939, that created, like, they already had that fear of something, but they just didn't have a name or a way to identify it. Right. That's how they identified it because they created 1939. That's what... Yeah. So it's like that fear exists, but we got to give it something to identify with. Yeah. Oh, look what they're going to come up with. Let's come up with it now. <laughs> you know, so. so the question is, Did was Batman influenced by the ancient Mayans or Vice were the Earth. ancient Mayans influenced by Batman? That's that's really good. That's Boom. cool how he turned that around. Look at that. Chew on that for yeah, a while. Yeah, see that? You have people laying in bed going, huh. <laughs> <laughs> so it's almost like, you know, thank the third 1930s for the Mayan time. Right. They should be thanking them, actually, but. All right, so we're gonna uh, we're gonna move towards our our wrap up here, but I did want to touch on a couple different things. Um, I know Doug, you've had some adventures with your jumps team. Yes, lately. yes. I mean, as I mentioned over the past couple of weeks, you know, we uh, especially with COVID, but you know, kind of things slowed down a little bit. But uh, I, over the past couple of months, I've really been kicking it all back into gear. And uh, in fact, uh, first and foremost, uh, last Tuesday. Uh, the Tuesday before Halloween, we did an investigation. It was on a, a business in uh, located in Elmer, New Jersey, Salem County, close, you know, not far actually. It was act- I think it was actually the closest location I've ever investigated from my house. There you it was go. pretty nice. But anyway, but we were approached back during the Mullica Hill Ghost Walk uh, by many people. But this lady in particular, she worked at this location, and majority men work at this place. And... You know, she said that she found it funny, but also interesting that none of the men that work there would be in their this their office right. after dark. They refused to, and there's just always been stories. the his the, the history of the location goes back to like the 1940s. <clears throat> excuse me, where you know it's always been a business. Things from like car dealership to uh, you know general contractor, and and the property itself. I found actually goes back to where it's listed in the historical society as uh, Native Americans actually camped around that area, around the creek. So what were the uh, claims? So uh, one in particular is interesting. I mean, a door. Now, again, you don't think much of a door, but there was this particular door. I guess it was the original one, like since the building was put up. Right. They had it located on the first floor for a while, and people that were in their offices... They would hear the door open and close and hear footsteps like someone was getting ready to walk past their their office. Like they were getting ready to see who it was and nobody would be there. And since they had moved the doors a few, the, the one door a few months ago to the owner of the company's office up on the second floor. Yeah. And uh, when he did that, all of a sudden for him, he'd be sitting in his office or whatnot or they would hear that same door open and close. I mean, again, when you look at attachment, like we've talked about before, spirits have been said to be able to attach themselves to objects. Why, in particular, could it be this door? So was the door literally opening and closing, or just it, the noise? No, it was literally opening okay. and closing. I mean, so we did the investigation. Obviously, had something set up on the door, trying to test that. Um, had, uh, uh, again, some of your basic claims. You know, they would actually, the, the feelings of being watched, again, being uncomfortable being there at night. Uh, a lot of footsteps. Uh, we actually had one person in particular, no longer works there, but they feel like he experienced something a little bit more than what he said because he just up and quit one day, and he was always terrified of the place. So, yeah. again, brought us into the fact that, you know, you have these grown men don't want to be in the place, so let's check it out. Still reviewing the evidence, um, <clears throat> which I should actually have done here in the next, like, two, three days and um, present it to them. But I will say, I mean, we had a lot of personal experiences. I even posted, uh, did a Facebook Live where I did some alone time on our Jumps Facebook page where I was getting some responses on our K2 meter, which 
measures electromagnetic fields and answer yes or no questions. Right. And again, getting some very significant responses. But one thing that's crazy that barely happens is uh, one of my investigators, Katrina, Claire, you've met Katrina, myself, right. and and Colette, right. Melly's daughter, Colette. She, they were, we were investigating one of the offices, and it was where the door used to be. Well, out of nowhere, we all of a sudden got this like vanilla smell. Now, of course, we look around for everything, like see if it was one of them blow air fresheners right. anywhere, and it lasted for like five seconds and went away. We searched high and low all over the place. We couldn't find anything, and it never happened again. Thinking something was on a timer. I mean. Again, uh, it was it was pretty interesting. It was very cool, and going with what I'm hoping we find in the evidence, uh, you know, we will find some things. So far, nothing. But again, we aren't done yet. So, so. was there a uh, a story from the people that worked there that had referenced like a vanilla smell or no, something like that? Or was no that just one, random? No, no one ever. That wasn't part of the claim. I brought that up to the clients, asking if that ever happened, and they even. Uh, when they came, when the one person came back at night to lock everything up, and we were done, we even had them help look. I right. mean, we were looking high and low, couldn't find any source. Hmm. So interesting. I mean, one of the things I'm still trying to go back and forth with, which again I will once I review everything, is could this be a residual or an intelligent? You right. know. So right. again, it all is a puzzle putting it together, and then uh, again got some things coming up. Uh, Two that I'm excited about, and finally, the Jumps website. Uh, I've been working on a lot. In fact, there's going to be one interactive part where I'll set up a camera that is interactive. People can watch during our investigations. It'll be set up and be able to like talk during it and see a live view. So that's all in the works right now. So very cool, cool very, stuff very cool. coming up. Very very cool. Yeah. All right. So I want to wrap up here again by uh, reminding you guys this Sunday afternoon, mm -hmm. twelve noon at Lincoln Financial Field, we're going to be doing our Toxic tailgate. We're gonna have all the toxic uh, personalities up uh, on the uh, on like say on stage, but no, uh, on stage, not on stage. But, <laughs> but they'll be there. on location. On location, they'll be there, right? Uh, gonna have some live broadcast. Gonna give out a bunch of swag. Mike just said he's got a whole bunch of t-shirts and hoodies and whatnot to uh, to give away. Mm -hmm. So you know. We're, not everyone's gonna have to work as hard as Doug. Doug I don't know why me. Doug's all gonna time. have to work specifically all hard for his. Freaking time, I'll tell you. All you other guys, we'll we'll give them to you. But Doug, Doug's gonna work for I'll his. I'll just summon the aliens to visit him tonight <laughs> and change his mind. So again, twelve noon lot in Lake Nancy near the Jetro uh, parking lot, or in the Jetro, Jetro parking lot. Um, and the game's at four fifteen, four twenty. So you guys will have plenty of time to uh, get your drink on, get your uh, toxic on. Mm-hmm. It'll be a fun time. Even if you don't have tickets, like even if you don't have tickets to the game, it's you can still come hang oh, out yeah. and party. I guess you don't have to be going to the game to a lot of people have do a good that. time. Oh yeah, people tailgate and they don't have they've never people, had a ticket to the game in their lives. Probably do that every week. They're yeah. like you know it's a guaranteed once a week part. Well, not once a week if they're home, but anywhere any NFL thing. I used to it's sit like, behind my buddy and I used to sit behind. We used to get there early. We used to sit behind this guy who had a. Um, a renovated Mr. Softy truck. Mm -hmm. So he had the back of it cut out, and he, and the, the the back came down. Right, and was like a little area you could put lawn chairs on. And inside, they had um, food on each side of the, of oh, the yeah. uh, inner you know inner truck. Right, and on the back wall, which backed up against the cab of the truck, a giant screen TV. That's what I was going to say. There are people that, like you said, they will go there and they'll watch oh, yeah. the game on TV. It, that's all they want to do is watch it, the game it, on TV, but they want to tailgate. There. But they can be there and they can actually hear the yeah. crowd still. I mean, yeah. granted, there's a huge delay. You'll probably hear that a touchdown happen <laughs> before you see it on the TV. But hey, I mean. <laughs> but it's uh, yeah, it's going to be a good time. So if yeah, you guys want to have uh, have some fun Sunday before the game, come on down. Meet us uh, meet us in Lot N. And, uh, what else are you doing? Come we'll, on. We'll get our, uh, we'll get our rock on. Yeah. Get our music on. Get our rocks off. Sounds good. Well, well. <laughs> one way or another, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So once again, uh, we are Paradelphia. We're on social media. You can look for us on Facebook, on Twitter, at Paradelphia. Uh, if you guys are watching on the interwebs here, you guys can see right under our names. We have the, uh, well, Doug has his Jumps uh, yep. Facebook page, and I have the at Twitter, or I'm sorry, at Twitter, at Paradelphia Twitter handle. Uh, say what I always say. Just Google us. Google us. <laughs> also, uh, at Toxic Radio Live, if you want to go to Toxic Radio's Twitter page or look them up on Facebook or uh, Instagram or, I don't know, Mike's probably got a TikTok working somewhere. 
I still you don't, do, don't you? You I still TikTok. don't get that. Why we want to watch a video that lasts three seconds? Oh, uh, Lord. <laughs> All right, so we're going to wrap things up for the night. Uh, it was a fun evening talking about uh, the uh, possible origins of Batman. Batman, and did they create it back then, or did we create it yeah. now that for is the it back then? That, get it. That is the question. <laughs> All right, so we're going to wrap things up. So for Doug, for uh, our crew in the uh, booth, I am Rick Pruitt. Yep. We are Paradelphia, and we are out of here. Mm-hmm.